like the chemical signals, which we said there are three types of them, receptors, there are a whole variety of receptors, and they, they can be classified based on their location within the cell or based on their function. We are going to focus here the discussion on the classification of receptors based on location. And the location here, we mean but where are those receptors located on the target cells. And in that respect, we have, we have two types. The first type is a group of receptors that are found within the cell, and that's why they are known as cytoplasmic receptors. Those receptors are found usually in the cytoplasm of cells, and then they bind to signals to uh, to uh, ligands that actually can very freely cross the membrane. In other words, those molecules, they have to be nonpolar for them to cross the phospholipid bilayer. So any ligand or any chemical signal that is nonpolar by nature, can, and if it's a small molecule, can easily cross the membrane um, and uh, would interact with a receptor located within the cytoplasm. Example of the, this type of um, ligands uh, is steroid hormones, for example. Steroid hormones are steroids and they are lipids. They, um, they can cross very easily the membrane and their receptors are found within the cytoplasm. The second type or second class of general receptors are found embedded in the membrane and that's why they are known as transmembrane receptors. And those are located on the surface of, uh, of cells. And uh, the binding site, the binding site that we see here that can recognize ligands is located actually on the outside, on the extracellular surface of the membrane. And, and it involves binding to ligands that cannot cross the membrane because of their polarity. An example here would be that of um, proteins, for example, that act as signal, signaling molecules like insulin, hormone, act this way. You have adrenaline, also another hormone, which is much smaller. It's not a protein. Uh, it's derived from amino acids. It's a polar structure, but very small. Cannot cross the membrane because of its polarity and uh, has its receptor on the surface. Therefore, it's a transmembrane receptor. Let's look into more details um, into uh, cytoplasmic receptors. And here we are going to give the example of a steroid hormone known as cortisol. Cortisol is, uh, is a, an important hormone in the body and it uh, controls different things. One of the things that it controls is it regulates the metabolism of sugars, carbohydrates, in the body. Well, we will talk about uh, cortisol hormones later on when we talk about the endocrine system. But let's look here at the, um, the receptor system of steroid, which is an example of cytoplasmic hormone. So the signal is released from its source, and that source could be anywhere in the body, but uh, for now we are, we're, we're going to say just uh, it's, uh, its site of secretion. It's a lipid, it's a steroid-derived uh, hormone, it's, it will diffuse freely into the cytoplasm from the outside, and it's going to bind to its receptor, the brown part that you see here. The receptor and it's going to form a receptor ligand complex uh, that uh, the receptor itself is bound to another protein and it's inactive in that form once you get the binding of the hormone to the binding site which is similar or analogous to the, an active site of an enzyme the chaperone protein that that causes the inactivation of the receptor is released and now the complex is formed and that complex is actually is in its in its active form that complex will diffuse into the nucleus and would act inside the nucleus as a transcription factor which is a complex or a protein complex that would enhance or would promote transcription resulting in the formation of specific proteins now in the example of membrane receptors, membrane receptors, uh, this is a, a huge class of receptors in um, multicellular organisms, and there is a whole variety of them, of uh, different types, of different subtypes. But uh, for, for sake of simplicity here, we are going to divide them into three main classes of membrane receptors. The first one is ion channel receptors. Now, we've seen ion channels before, um, 
as uh, proteins that, that allow certain ions to cross. Now, the difference between an ion channel as a uh, part of facilitated diffusion versus an ion channel receptor is that an ion cha channel receptor is actually a gated ion channel. And by gated, I mean that it has a sort of like a gate. It could be, or in other words, it could be in two forms. In, in a closed form like this one, or in an open form like that one. When it's closed, no ions can cross. When it's open, ions can diffuse along their concentration gradient. So only when they are open, they act um, as similar to ion channels that we have seen before and would facilitate the diffusion. But the importance here is that they are gated. And there are different types of gated ion uh, channel receptors. Um, some of them open in response to chemical signals. So they are chemically gated. Like in that case here, the, uh, they bind to acetylcholine, which is a chemical signal released from nerve cells. The binding here would cause the ion channel to open and allowing in that case here specific ions, which is sodium ions, to move along their concentration gradient. Um, other gated ion channels could respond to uh, light, they could uh, respond to sound, to pressure, or sometimes to change in voltage, as we are going to see later on when we talk about the nervous system. So this is the first class of membrane receptors, ion channel receptors. The second type is protein kinase receptors. And this is a very important uh, group of receptors, and we are going to give the example of insulin receptors here. Insulin receptors are found on many different cells inside the body, and uh, when they interact with insulin, they cause changes in the cell that uh, would result in the actual storage of glucose inside those cells. The receptor itself, when it's inactive, uh, consists of uh, two units, one and two. And when these, uh, when these two units are not bound to their ligand, the insulin, they are separate from each other, but very close to each other. When you have insulin, insulin is going to bind to each subunit. So we have one molecule of insulin binding here and another one binding there. And the binding would cause the two subunits to come together to form a complex. And that complex would cause, in many cases, the protein to phosphorylate itself, for the receptor to phosphorylate itself. So as you can see here, we have lots of phosphate groups that were added from ATP. And that autophosphorylation would cause the activation of the receptor which can now actually activate other proteins inside the cell. So from a signal outside the cell we get activation of the part of the receptor that is found inside the cell. Now we get phosphorylation of this protein and now this protein is active and it can phosphorylate other proteins and so on. We, we call this a phosphorylation cascade from one protein to another, we get phosphorylation of one protein after the other, resulting in a final cellular response, which that part we will talk about in the next, or in part two of uh, this topic. So that's the second type of membrane receptors. So remember here, the first one was ion channel receptors, the second one is protein kinase receptors, um, and again, we, we, call, we call them kinases because they phosphorylate, they are involved in phosphorylation reactions. Now, the third part, which is the uh, um, most important uh, membrane receptors, are known as G-protein-coupled receptors. Those are transmembrane receptors. The protein spans the membrane several times. In most cases, it's seven transmembrane domains. These domains are embedded within the uh, hydrophobic part of the phospholipid bilayer, so they are hi highly hydrophobic, with an extracellular part and an intracellular part. The extracellular part has a special area here that can recognize and bind the ligand, and then there's another part found inside the cell, in the cytosolic part of the receptor, and that part actually can interact with a protein known as G protein. Let's look at this interaction in more detail here. So initially what will happen is that a signal would bind to the receptor on the outside. That interaction, that binding as we look here, that binding would result in a change in the shape of the receptor. We call it a change in the configuration of the receptor. And that change would cause the activation of a G protein that you see here. That G protein is called G protein because 
in order for this protein to become active, it has to bind to GTP, which is similar to ATP. That binding will activate the G protein and would cause it to split into two pieces. As you can see, the G protein has one, two, three subunits. When it's activated by the receptor, it's going to bind GTP and this would cause it to split. One of the subunits that is found here would split and then it would slide along the membrane on the cytosolic surface of the membrane. And then when it encounters another protein, a third protein, the first protein was this one, the second protein was the receptor, the second protein is the G protein, and then the third protein is actually an enzyme. We call it an effector protein. That protein, when the GTP unit is going to encounter that effector protein, it's going to activate it. It's going to become active, and that's an enzyme and it's going to start catalyzing a reaction. That uh, reaction usually would result in the formation of a certain product, and that product is, is produced in large quantities. So the reaction actually is an amplification of a certain signal. The first signal was here, now the second signal is inside the cell, is here, and it's from one molecule here, we can end up with a huge number of molecules inside the cell. That the, the product here is known as second messenger. The first messenger was the actual ligand on the outside and the second messenger is the product of that enzyme. Second messengers that are produced by cells, uh, one famous one is cyclic AMP, it's produced from ATP, so it's cyclic adenosine monophosphate. There's also cyclic GMP as another type of second messenger produced from GTP there's also calcium ions can act also as second messengers.